many German Nobel Prizes, there's probably because there's so many German physicists and because they start to get to work so early. Uh, so this is going to be a talk about, uh, about quantum algorithms. Uh, from the perspective of theoretical computer science, I'm a theoretical computer scientist, but I'll, I'll try to make it sort of accessible to a physics audience. Um, so quantum computers, uh, where do they come from? Well, they combine quantum and computer science. Of course, quantum you're all familiar with. Quantum mechanics was developed starting 1900. Uh, I have two pictures here of Max Planck and Niels Bohr, but there's many more people, Schrodinger, Heisenberg, etc. Uh, there's also Alan, uh, Alan Turing, who started uh, computer science in the 1930s, who really sort of developed this as a mathematical enterprise. And he was recently given the honor of being put on the English money. Uh, his face is now on the 50 pound uh, bills. I'm not actually sure how much of an honor that is, because it's the highest domination bill in the UK, which means this money is mostly used by drug, uh, drug traffickers and so on. Right, so, so this, is, this is kind of ancient history. Both of these developments are almost 100 years old. And in the 1980s, they were combined into one field, which is called quantum computing. Right, so Richard Feynman and subsequently David Deutsch, they asked the question, okay, quantum mechanics is quite different from the, the classical physics that, that we know and that our usual computers are based on. Uh, can we use those quantum effects to improve computers significantly? Um, and so my talk is to, to basically describe you where we are. In, in, in that endeavor. Uh, let me give you a little bit of math, uh, not too much. Um, and I assume since everybody here is a physicist, you'll be very familiar with quantum mechanics. Um, and quantum computing really is almost like a toy version of quantum mechanics. There's nothing very fancy here. In fact, we don't even have infinite dimensional Hilbert spaces. We just have finite dimensional Hilbert spaces. So the, the short summary is that quantum states are vectors and quantum operations are matrices, all finite dimensional for my simple case. Um, and we will associate uh, two dimensional vectors with the two possible values that a classical bit can take. So if you look inside your computer, you open it up, which would void the warranty, but you can open it up anyway. Uh, you'll see that the bit is, is some switch which can be on or off, zero or one, and that's, that's what a classical bit is, and your classical computer will have tons of these things. Right, so we're going to associate uh, a two-dimensional vector, 0, 1, to represent a bit value 0, cat 0, and we're going to associate an orthogonal vector, 0, 1, to, to represent the bit value that's 1. And now the beauty of quantum mechanics is that we are allowed to take superpositions of these two values, so a qubit or a quantum bit uh, can be in any superposition of the value 0 and the value 1 with complex amplitudes alpha 0 and alpha 1. Um, and any reasonable two-level physical system could be used to implement a quantum bit. So uh, I'm, what I'm going to say here is really not hardware dependent. I'm just going to assume that somebody uses some two-dimensional physical system to implement quantum bits. Um, and you can think of, for instance, an, an electron spin, which is very naturally a two-dimensional system, right? You could have spin up corresponding to cat zero, spin down corresponding to cat one. Uh, but also things like photon polarization, or let's say if you have an ion trapped somewhere and you can identify its ground state with a cat zero and its first excited state with cat one. And there's many different, very natural two-dimensional physical systems that can and have been used to implement quantum bits. Um, and of course, one quantum bit is not very much, so we need to really sort of look at long sequences or arrays of quantum bits. So in general, if you have an, an n qubit system, it's going to be a superposition not over cat zero and cat one, but a superposition over all possible two to the n n bit strings, right? Uh, there, if you have one bit, there's two possibilities. If you have two bits, there's four possibilities. If you have three bits, there's eight possibilities, possibilities et cetera. If you have n qubits, there are two to the n possibilities, namely classical strings. And your quantum state of n qubits is going to be a superposition of all those possibilities with a complex amplitude alpha x for each classical string x. So that's a, an exponential dimensional vector in, in complex space. Uh, and you can measure such a state. And uh, according to the Born rule, uh, if you measure this fully, you're going to see one of the classical states, one cat x. Uh, and whichever one you're going to see, you can't predict it in advance, but you can at least predict the probability distribution, which is given by the squared amplitudes. Right, so this also implies that the, the squared amplitudes have to sum to one, so they form a valid probability distribution. Right, and in addition to, uh, to measuring a state, you can also do operations on it, which is going to be essential for a quantum computer. 
Um, and what are operations? Well, if you think about classically, what would you do to manipulate a string of classical bits? Uh, if you look, for instance, at what happens inside a chip, then there are these simple logic gates that operate on your bits. Right, so for instance, you can have the, uh, the not gate, it just flips a bit, so zero goes to one, one goes to zero. You can have the end gate, it takes two input bits and it outputs an output bit, which is one, if and only if both input bits are one. You can have an or gate. Um, and in general, these three simple gates, end, or, and not gates, they are sufficient to implement any kind of classical operation you want on a string of n bits. Uh, and a quantum computer is something analogous to this, where instead of having these classical logic gates, we have quantum gates, simple quantum gates acting on one or two qubits at a time. So a very simple example is sort of the quantum version of the not gate. So if you think about something that maps cat zero to cat one and cat one to cat zero, and you represent that as a matrix, it's going to be this simple two by two matrix. This of course is not really a quantum operation. It just flips two classical bit values. A more interesting quantum operation is the Hadamard gate. This is a, this is again, a, it's a two dimensional operation. So it acts on two dimensional vectors. So this corresponds to acting on one qubit. Qubit corresponds to a two dimensional vector. Um, so for instance, if you take a classical bit, which is in state zero, you apply the Hadamard to it. What do you get? You just do the matrix vector calculation and you get a uniform superposition of the two bit values. This is the way you create superpositions. Um, if you were to do the same with the starting state one, you get again a uniform superposition, except that there's a minus sign in front of the cat one. And this minus sign is what makes all the difference between classical and quantum computing. Right, for instance, let's see what happens if we now apply the Hadamard gates to something which is already a superposition. So if you apply the Hadamard gates to something which is already a uniform superposition of zero and one, right, everything here is linear. So you can just plug in the previous line for h cat zero, the previous line for h cat one, fill that out. And now you will see that the, the amplitudes, uh, the, the contributions to the amplitude of cat one are partially positive and partially negative, and they actually add up to zero. And this is a, a, a tiny example of an interference effect. And it's really these interference effects that, that make a quantum computer tick. Uh, and of course, so far I've talked about uh, operations on individual qubits, but if you want to do something useful, you're going to have to interact different qubits. And for that, we have unitary gates that act on two qubits at the same time. And the canonical example of that is the so-called controlled not gate. And you can sort of think of it, this as an if-then statement. If the first bit is one, then you're going to flip the second bit, right? So if you have a basis state zero comma b, where b could be zero or one, then nothing happens to it after the C naught gate. If you have one comma b, where again b can be zero or one, then after the C naught gate, the b bit is flipped. Zero becomes one, one becomes zero, right? So this is like an if-then statement. If my first bit is one, then apply an X gate or a naught gate to the first qubit. Um, and in addition, like if you have a few extra single qubit gates on top of what is already on the slide, that's actually enough to do quantum computation. Right, so just to summarize, if we, if we want to shift over from classical computers to quantum computers, bits become qubits. The classical end or not gates become these unitary quantum gates like the controlled knots or like the Hadamard. They're just acting on tiny parts of the state. A classical circuit made up of end or not gates becomes a quantum circuit made up of, of Hadamars and C nots and some other gates. Uh, and last but not least, reading the output bits or whatever output of the circuits, classically you would just sort of go to the, whatever the end, end points of your, your circuit and read off whether there are zeros or ones there. In the quantum case, your circuit will have generated some superposition and you need to make a measurement to get a classical answer out. Um, and in general, the way we measure the complexity of a circuit is, is how many gates are being done. If you have a classical circuit and it uses a thousand end or a not gates, then the amount of work you need to do to run the circuit is proportional to a thousand. Similarly, if you have a quantum circuit with a bunch of gates, let's say a thousand C nots or Hadamard gates, uh, the complexity of that circuit is a thousand because you need to do sort of a thousand units of work to run those gates on your circuit, on your state. Here's a very simple example of a quantum circuit. Um, so here, the picture is always read from left to right. The starting state is just classical, two zeros. Everything is a two qubit state here. And you start by creating, uh, by applying a Hadamard gate on the first qubit. And what that does is it, it puts the first qubit into a uniform superposition of zero and one. The second qubit is still zero. So at this point, at this point after the Hadamard gate, our joint state is one over root two, zero, zero, plus one, zero. 
Uh, and now you do a controlled not gate. What does it do? Well, it looks at the part of the superposition where the first bit is one. Remember, it's, this is like an if-then statement. And for the part of the superposition where the first bit is one, it flips the second bit. So we now have this state here. And this is a very important state. It's this so-called Einstein-Podolsky-Rosen state, EPR state. Uh, and this is the canonical example of, of a state that is entangled. It's a two-qubit state. Uh, and you can't write it as a tensor product of one state for the first qubit and the, another state for the second qubit. This is sort of quantum correlated, and this is called entanglement. And then this is this very simple circuit here, starting from a classical state, actually makes an EPR pair for you, and it only uses two gates. Right, just, just to illustrate how quantum circuits work. Uh, so what are quantum mechanical computers? Well, they're, they're effectively something that run a circuit to do something useful. So you start with all qubits in some easily preparable state, let's say all zero. And I'm not really going to talk about how to do this physically. Typically, it involves some heavy-duty cooling, but that's, that's really not what I'm going to talk about. So you start with some easily preparable quantum state. Uh, then you run a circuit, a quantum circuit of, of elementary quantum gates. Uh, that produces the right kind of interference. And, and roughly speaking, what you would like to do is you have all these paths going on at the same time in the superposition, all sorts of different computational paths in superposition. Some of those leads to the right answer. Some of those lead to the wrong answer of the computational problem you want to solve. Uh, and the goal is to let the computational paths that lead to the right answer, to let those interfere constructively. For instance, if all the amplitudes are positive, the final amplitude on such a path will be even more positive. And the path leading to wrong answers, you want to sort of let those interfere destructively, so pluses and minuses would add up to almost zero. And this, of course, is much easier said than done, right? The, the, the beauty and the trick and the art of quantum computing is in setting up the right kind of interference. And we only know a few cases where, where we can really do this. And of course, let me not forget that once you've run step number two, you've generated some massive superposition, and you need to do some measurement to get the classical answer out of your computation. And there's really two important questions you can ask about such a machine. The first one, of course, is can we build it? Um, and, and I'm happy to say that this is not my problem. Uh, this is a very tough problem. Uh, the, currently, the biggest quantum computers we have are on the order of 50, 60, maybe 70 qubits. So Google is working on a 70 qubit quantum computer. This is mightily impressive uh, as, as an experimental physics task. Uh, and, and like I say, this is not the stuff I'm working on. I'm a theoretical computer scientist. So what I am working on is, is the question, what could such a machine do if somebody else would build it for me? Right? So this is the question, like, what kind of problems can you solve much faster on a quantum computer than on a classical computer? So this talk is going to focus specifically on quantum algorithms. And quantum algorithms are recipes or sort of ways to set up a quantum circuit to solve certain computational problems much faster than you could do on a classical computer. And I'm going to mention three examples of these are probably the three most famous quantum algorithms. Uh, Shor's algorithm for factoring large numbers, Grover's algorithm for search, and the HHL algorithm for uh, solving large systems of equations. And basically, the purpose of this talk is just to explain these three algorithms. So for each of them, I have a slide saying what the algorithm does, and I have a slide sketching how it does it. As of course, this, is, these, this sketch is not super rigorous, but at least I try to convey some idea of how these things work how they set up the right kind of interference. Right, and before going to those three algorithms, let me um, give you a general technique called quantum parallelism, uh, which, which is typically the starting point of all quantum algorithms, and which by itself is totally useless. And the idea of quantum parallelism is the following. So suppose you have some classical algorithm which can compute some function for you. It's a function on, on n input bits, so there's two to the n possible inputs. And let's say it produces an m-bit output. And let's say there's some efficient circuit, classical circuit, uh, that computes this function. Right? Now, you can convert this uh, quite easily to a quantum circuit that computes the same function. This quantum circuit needs to be a unitary, so we, and unitaries are reversible. So what we typically do is we, we implement such a, a computation of f as a unitary map with two registers, the first containing the input x, the second initially containing 0, and then the answer f of x would be written into this second register. Right? This is now actually a reversible computing. You can implement it as a unitary circuit, and the number of gates of this quantum circuit will be about the same as the number of gates you used classically. And the beauty here is, of course, you can, you can apply this unitary u now on a superposition of different inputs, and that's what quantum parallelism is and does. Right? So you can compute f 
quote unquote, on all inputs X simultaneously, works as follows. So you first put your first register into a uniform superposition of all X's, all two to the N X's. This is very easy to do by starting with a bunch of zeros and applying a Hadamard gate to each of them that will create this uniform superposition over all X's. Second register, the one that's gonna contain the answer is still zero. And now on this superposition, we run our unitary U. And we only need to do it at once, thanks to the beauty of linearity. And the net effect of that is that we get a uniform superposition over all X's of X comma FX, right? Which means that in one go, we have now computed our function F on all two to the N inputs simultaneously. Um, and if you read a newspaper article about quantum computing, this is typically where they stop and they declare victory. And it's, this is very misleading because by itself, this is a totally useless thing that we have done here, right? Because in some sense, this state contains all the values of F on all the two to the N inputs simultaneously, but each one only with a tiny, tiny amplitude. So there's no way you're gonna get all those values out of this one quantum state that you created. You could try to measure it, of course, if you measure this state, what's gonna happen, you will collapse randomly to a particular x comma fx, right? This, like I said, this is totally useless because you could have done exactly the same thing classically. You just uniformly at random choose some x, run your classical circuit for f, and you get exactly the same outcome as what your quantum parallelism has produced. So to do real quantum computation, you really need a second ingredient, and the second ingredient is interference. Right, so sort of the, the take home message, and if there's any journalists in the room, the take home message uh, of quantum computers is it's really an interplay of superposition and interference that makes a quantum computer tick. A quantum computer is not some parallel classical computer. It's, it's very different. And setting up this interference here, this is typically the subtle, the subtle part of the quantum computer. Good, so now we're gonna talk about uh, the three main algorithms that I wanted to explain in this talk. And the first one is, uh, is Shor's algorithm. And Shor's algorithm is highly relevant for cryptography. What is cryptography? You probably have heard about it before. It's, it's the science of secure and or private communication. And it's, it's what underpins most of the internet. If you do a credit card payment on the internet, uh, this will be protected by cryptography, classical cryptography. And a lot of that, uh, classical cryptography that's used today, that's massively used today, billions of times every day, um, is based on the assumption, and we don't know how to prove this, it's based on the assumption uh, that, it's, that it's hard for classical computers to factor large numbers into their prime factors. Right, so, so what is the factoring problem? Well, here's a very simple number, 15, and this is the kind of thing that you can factor into the prime numbers just sort of in your mind, right? This is three times five. Three and five are prime numbers. Here is a moderately larger number, which is kind of hard to factor in your head, but your computer could definitely do it, uh, and it turns out to be the product of these two prime numbers here. Uh, but as you can already see, as you, if you try to do this in your head, like this problem tends to get significantly more complicated if you have more digits in the number that you want to factor. And if you look at numbers, for instance, that have 400 digits, which corresponds to roughly 1300 bits, it's gonna take years, maybe even centuries, on our best classical computers to factor such a number into its prime factors. This is a very tough problem, as far as we know. We can't prove anything. This is related to the P versus NP problem. But as far as we know, this is a very hard problem to solve for classical computers. And somehow this is used as the basis for cryptography. Somehow the idea is that multiplying two numbers is very easy, going back the other way, factorization is very hard, and this sort of asymmetry in the two directions, this is what underlies cryptography. And it came as a big shock uh, 25 years ago when Peter Shore showed that on quantum computers, you can actually efficiently factor very large numbers into their prime factors, right? Which means that if you could build a large quantum computer, you could break all this cryptography. Um, and certainly, uh, many people will be interested in this, the secret services, but also the mafia, right? So here you see the godfather holding Schrodinger's cat, and he would be very happy to have a quantum computer so he could run Shore's algorithm to steal all your money. And break into your bank account to steal your money. Right, so this is a big thing. And this, this, like this algorithm from 25 years ago, this is really what converted the field of quantum information and quantum computation from a slightly fringy field with maybe 100 people working on it to a massive field with large amounts of money flowing in. Uh, probably there's now thousands of people working on these things. So we, are, we have it all to thank uh, Peter Shore for that. Uh, this, this is the most important quantum algorithm. I'm gonna mention two others, but this is the most important of the three that I'm gonna mention. 
And we cannot run it today because you need a few thousand good qubits, really good qubits, to run Shor's algorithm, and we're very far from that technologically. But if at some point somebody builds a large fault-tolerant quantum computing, this algorithm is going to have a massive impact. We would have to completely change our cryptographic infrastructure. Right, and I, I promised you a one-slide sketch of each of the three algorithms that I, that I wanted to go over in this talk. So here's my one-slide sketch for Shor's algorithm. Right, and this is going to be slightly impressionistic, but you might still get some vague idea of how this works. There's really two parts to Shor's algorithm. The first is a classical part, and the second is a quantum part. So the first is a, a classical reduction to a so-called period-finding problem. Um, and this is really classical. Like, it, it doesn't use quantum computers, but it also this has been known for centuries. Probably Euler already knew about this stuff. So how does it work? So there's this large number capital N that we want to factor, right? Think about it as, as a number with, I don't know, 2,000 bits or so. It's easy to write it down. It's very hard to factor it. So what we're going to do is we're going to choose a random integer C, which is less than capital N. That's very easy to do. You just flip 2,000 bits, and that's going to be a random number that's less than capital N. Uh, and you define the following function here. And this is an efficiently compu computable function called modular exponentiation. So what it does is, if you input some number x, some integer x, it, it calculates this number c to the power x modulo the number n. Um, and maybe it's not totally obvious, but you can actually very efficiently calculate this in time polynomial in the number of bits of your numbers. I won't explain how that works. And the interesting thing about this algorithm, and it's very to see with a little bit of group, it's, it's easy to see with a little bit of group theory, is that this is a periodic function. So this is a, a function that kind of looks like this. So it, its behavior repeats. Um, and it's going to have some period p, which could be a very large number, could also have a 2,000 bits uh, uh, precision, if you want to write that down. Uh, and the thing is that this unknown period p, if you were able to find it, you could factor the number n. This is very simple classical number theory. I'm not going to explain it. But if you could find the period of this periodic function, which I define here, you can actually factor the number n. Right, and now you might think, okay, that's great. You know, I'm just going to sort of put in numbers into my function f. I try f on 0, on 1, on 2, on 3, on 4, etc., until I see the first time that it cycles. But the cycle could be huge. The cycle p could be as big as the number capital N you're going to factor. Right, so something on the size like 2 to the power 2,000. That, that's no way you're going to efficiently, classically try out all the possibilities. So finding this period, as far as we know, it take, you can't really do it efficiently on a classical computer. That's a good thing, because otherwise our cryptography would be broken today. Now, what Shor did is he gave a quantum algorithm for finding this period of this periodic function. Um, and the way the quantum algorithm works, and this is going to be a very short sketch, is as follows. You first generate a superposition over all the inputs. Now, you might complain now, all the inputs, there's infinitely many of them. So we really sort of cut it off at some point. We, we create a superposition, a uniform superposition, over all the x's, 0, 1, 2, 3, et cetera, up to some sufficiently large number. There's going to be exponentially many x's in this superposition. This is easy to do. And now we use this trick of quantum parallelism. And we compute the value of f on all of these x's in one go, using the beauty of superposition. Also easy to do. And then we measure the second register, right? So that's going to sort of zoom in on one particular function value. And the first register is now going to collapse to only the x's that have that same function value. But those x's, because this is a periodic function, those x's are separated from one another by exactly this period. So what you have now is you're going to see some particular value f at s in the second register, which you measured. And the first register, which initially was a superposition over all x's, is now going to collapse only to the ones that are spaced by period p. So you're going to have a superposition now over s, s plus p, s plus 2p, s plus 3p, et cetera. And this is an extremely nice periodic uh, vector of amplitudes, right? It's just going to have peaks uh, spaced by the same period p. And now comes the, the sort of the punchline. If you do a, a quantum version of the Fourier transform, you can actually extract what that period is with a bit of work. Right? I'm not going to explain how that works, but you're probably, you've probably seen Fourier transforms. Fourier transforms are extremely good uh, into converting uh, a periodic signal into the information about the frequency, uh, the frequency of, of, of that period. And the frequency is essentially 1 over the period here. So using an efficient quantum circuit for the Fourier transform on this exponential superposition, you can actually learn the period p. 
But from part one, we already knew if you can find a period P, you can factor your large number. Right, so this is a very short summary of Shor's algorithm. You reduce everything classically to a periodic function, and then you use the quantum Fourier transform to find that periodicity, and that's enough to factor. Okay, so now comes the second, the second algorithm that I, that I want to explain. This came uh, two years after Shor in 1996, and this is about a search problem. So suppose you have some very large search space with, let's say, capital N possible locations. This is a totally different, different problem as before, so this N has nothing to do with the number you want to factor, it's just the size of some large search space. Um, and if in this large search space there's one point in the search space that sort of is the solution to whatever you're looking for, then on a classical computer you basically have to go through almost all of that search space to find it, right? You could sort of go through it linearly, you could try go through it randomly, but if you're not lucky you're gonna have to look at least at half of the points in the search space to, to try to find the solution of your, your search problem. Uh, and Grover, Love Grover, in 96, he devised a quantum algorithm that solves the same problem in only about square root of n amount of work. Um, and on the one hand, this is a speed up which is much less than, than Shor's algorithm, but so Shor's algorithm is exponentially faster than the best classical factoring algorithms that we know. Grover's algorithm is only quadratically faster, but this is a very widely applicable problem, like search problems all, all over the place in computer science, and all of those you can speed up by plugging in Grover's algorithm, if you have a sufficiently large quantum computer, of course. Right, so Grover's algorithm finds a needle in a haystack, and it finds it much faster than classical search can. And let me just mention two of these applications where you can use Grover's algorithm as a subroutine. Uh, you can maximize a function on a domain of size n in, in roughly about root n steps. This might be relevant for machine learning because machine learning is essentially some large optimization problem. And also, for instance, if, you, if you're driving your car, let's say from, from Freiburg to Berlin, you have a map of Germany in your computer memory, you want to find the shortest route from Freiburg to Berlin. There's a classical algorithm called Dijkstra's algorithm that solves this, but there's a faster quantum algorithm uh, which uses Grover's algorithm as a subroutine. So sort of navigation is, is one of the things you can speed up polynomially if you have Grover's algorithm at your disposal. Okay, so again, I'm coming back to my promise to give you a one slide summary of how this works. Here's the one slide summary. So there's these locations one up to N, capital N, and one of those locations, let's say I, is the solution you're looking for. And you can easily recognize a solution. If I give you the number i, you can say, ah, yeah, indeed, that's the thing I was looking for. Uh, but, you, of course, you have no idea where this i sits. Right? And the way the quantum uh, Grover algorithm works is as follows. So let's set up a little bit of notation. There's a good state, and the good state is what we want to end up with. It's just a superposition over the location of the solution. Right? So if capital N is like 2 to the power little n, then I'm going to use a, a a space of little n qubits, and such a space is big enough to hold all the possible addresses. So the good state is gonna be a little n qubit state, just concentrated on the one location I happen to be looking for, and the bad state is a uniform superposition over everything else, the hay in the haystack, so to speak. Um, and I'm gonna start, or rather Grover's algorithm is going to start in an easy to prepare state, namely the uniform superposition over all of the capital N locations, the good ones and the bad ones. Uh, and this uniform superposition, this is actually a linear combination of the good state and the bad state. It's sine of some angle theta times the good state plus cosine some angle theta times the bad state. And this theta here is arc sine one over root n. If you stare at this formula briefly, you will see that if you plug in this theta here, you're gonna get exactly uniform amplitudes for all of the indices between one and capital N. And in a picture, it looks like this, right? So notice that the good state and the bad state are orthogonal to each other which means you can write them down as the two axes of a two-dimensional picture, and the uniform state is gonna be here. And initially, of course, it's going to be very close to the bad state. There's, uh, why would you have a large overlap with the one good location? The overlap is only gonna be one over root capital N initially. So the picture looks like this, and what we would like to do is we would like to shift this vector over with a little bit of work to the good state, and then measure. And, and that's what Grover's algorithm does. It sort of successively rotates this state here, our initial state, it rotates it, rotates it towards the good state. So there's something called the Grover iteration, uh, which is relatively easy to, to implement. It doesn't take a lot of work. And it rotates this, this vector, so the current 
uh, state of our algorithm, it rotates it towards the good state by an angle of two theta. And that means that after doing k of these Grover iterations, your initial angle theta has grown to two k plus one theta, right? Every new Grover iteration, you're rotating another angle two theta in the right direction. So after k iterations, this is now your angle. And you would like this angle to be pi over two. If this angle were pi over two, you've rotated all the way to the good state. And at that point, you can measure and you get a solution. Um, so what do we need to choose k if we want this angle to be pi over two? So we can choose k to be roughly this. This is exactly the choice of k that's going to make this angle pi over two. Um, and the number of iterations we need for that choice of k is, is proportional to square root of capital N. So this is why the complexity of quantum search is only square root of capital N by about square root of N rotations, each by an angle two theta. You're gonna rotate the uniform superposition to the good state and at that point you're done. Right, so after this many rotations, your, your state is going to be the good state. If you measure the good state, you're gonna see the correct solution I with probability one because it's the only one that has any amplitude in the good state. So this is my, my short summary of uh, Grover's algorithm. How much time do I have, Tobias? 14, that's good, thanks. Okay, so, so we come to the third algorithm, which is a bit more recent. So Shor's algorithm was from 1994, Grover's algorithm was from 1996, and then nothing much seemed to happen for a long time. Uh, that's not quite true, there were sort of smaller developments, but I think the next, the third biggest algorithm was developed in 2009. Uh, and this is called the HHL algorithm, uh, named after Harrow, Hesedim, and Lloyd, its inventors. Um, and this is an algorithm that can solve, quote unquote, very large systems of linear equations, and it can do that very efficiently, under some assumptions. Right, so solving a very large system of linear, linear, linear equations, say AX equals B, think of A as a capital N by capital N matrix, B as a capital N dimensional vector, let's say over the complexes or the reals, your goal is to find a vector x that satisfies this equation. And this is really one of the most important problems you can have in, in science and, and, and in industry. If you could solve this problem fast, a lot of good things happen. So you're given a and b, and your goal is to find this vector x. And classically, it has been fairly well studied what is the complexity of solving this. And in general, it's going to be polynomial in the dimension of the matrix. So something like capital N or capital N squared. And if capital N is big, that's a lot of work. So Harrow, Hesedim, and Lloyd, uh, they came up with an algorithm, a fast quantum algorithm, that solves the same problem in kind of a weak way. Namely, instead of returning the capital N dimensional vector of X to you, written on a piece of paper, capital N numbers, um, it gives you the, the amplitude encoded version of this vector X. So it's gonna return to you a state of log capital N qubits, whose amplitudes, whose vector of amplitudes is exactly the vector X you were looking for up to normalization. And in some cases, this is quite useful. I would say it, it's not as useful as having the solution X written down on a piece of paper. But the good thing is this is in some cases useful and you can do it much faster than a classical linear system solver could. If the system is well behaved. So uh, Miles also mentioned the big if. Here you can really see it. It's a very big if. Um, if the system is well behaved. So Harrow, Hesedim, and Lloyd algorithm, uh, when it was uh, sort of published, people thought this is great. We're gonna solve linear systems of equations all over the place. Uh, but it turns out there's a lot of small print here. There's a big if and a lot of small print, uh, which says that you need to make certain assumptions on your system for the HHL algorithm to work efficiently. Let me list those assumptions. First assumption is that this vector B here, the right-hand side of your linear system, you need to be able to prepare it itself also efficiently as an amplitude encoded state. So you want to be able to compute the efficiently to prepare the state cat B. In some cases you can, in some cases you cannot. Um, you need to assume that this matrix A for which you're trying to solve uh, is well conditioned. So uh, the sort of the ratio between the largest and smallest uh, eigenvalues shouldn't be too, too big. Um, and last but not least, uh, in the algorithm as you will see, we need to be able to do the unitary operation corresponding to e to the power i A. You can assume without loss of generality that this A is a remission matrix, therefore you can interpret it as a Hamiltonian, and therefore this matrix here, e to the i a, this is actually a unitary matrix. And so the third assumption of the HHL algorithm is that this unitary matrix can actually be efficiently implemented, meaning in a small circuit. 
Uh, for this, it suffices if A is a very sparse matrix, for instance, and there's other sufficient conditions that make this possible. But it is, it's good to be explicit about these, uh, about these assumptions. So how does the harrow uh, Lloyd algorithm work? This is my one slide summary of how this algorithm works. So here's the input. The input is a remission matrix A, large dimension, capital M by capital N, a vector B of the same large dimension. Um, and our goal is to approximately prepare the vector X, which is the amplitude encoded version of the solution to this linear system. That's our goal. Uh, so let's, let's do a little bit of analysis. So this matrix A, it's remission. So it has capital N real eigenvalues. Call them lambda 1 up to lambda capital N. Uh, and it has associated eigenvectors, uh, which form an orthonormal system. That's what, what the remission matrices do. And our algorithm doesn't need to know what these things are, what the eigenvalues and the eigenvectors are. They're just, I, I wrote them down for the analysis of the algorithm. So here's the actual algorithm. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to prepare the amplitude encoded version of the vector B. Right? And remember, my first assumption was that I can actually do this efficiently. So I'm going to prepare this state here. This has log capital M qubits. And it corresponds to the right-hand side of my linear system. And what is it that I want to do? Well, so you can decompose this state here into the eigenvectors, because the eigenvectors of A form an orthonormal system. So there's going to be some decomposition, unknown to my algorithm, uh, which equates cat B with a linear combination of the, the eigenvectors of A with, with some amplitudes beta i. I don't know what the beta i's are, and I don't have to know. And notice that, what does it mean to apply A inverse? So what we want to do here, notice that if, if A is, uh, is non-singular, uh, then X is just A inverse times B. So effectively what we want to do is we want to apply the matrix A inverse to the vector B that will give us X. Uh, and that's equivalent to just multiplying the i th eigenvector with the inverse of the eigenvalue. Right? So A takes cat V i to lambda i cat V i, and therefore A inverse takes cat V i to 1 over lambda i cat V i. So all I really want to do here is I want to multiply this state here with the inverse, the reciprocal of the ith eigenvalue. But I don't have the ith eigenvalue, so what am I going to do? I'm going to use a technique called phase estimation. And, and maybe this is something I should have explained at the beginning of the talk. This is one of the core techniques of quantum algorithms. And effectively what it allows you to do is if you can apply a certain unitary, in this case e to the i a, remember one of my assumptions was that I can do this efficiently, if you can implement that unitary, and you have an eigenvector for that unitary, you can very efficiently estimate the phase of the associated eigenvalue. So I can very efficiently, uh, this involves a quantum Fourier transform, I can very efficiently write down in a second register, I can write down the eigenvalue that corresponds to, to cat v i. This is called phase estimation. Uh, and now I'm gonna attach one more qubit, initially zero, and I'm going to rotate that qubit over an angle which is at most one over lambda i. So the state is gonna look like this. Again, this is something I can do efficiently. I won't explain how. Um, and now I wanna get rid of this register here, the result of phase estimation, and I can do that by just inverting the phase estimation. So now this register here is not, not present anymore. And let's look at, at this state here. If you just look at the, the case where the last qubit is zero. If you look at the case where the last qubit is zero and this cat lambda i is no longer there, I've removed it then this, this is a scalar, right? This is a number. You can actually move it over to here, and that's exactly the state I want to prepare. So the state that I have now, you can rewrite it like this. There's a part of the state where the last qubit is zero, and there, the first register is exactly the state I wanted to prepare. It's the result of applying A inverse to cat B, and that's the cat X I'm trying to prepare. And there's a second, sort of annoying second part of the, the state where the last qubit is one, and I don't like that at all. There's two things I can do. I can now measure this last qubit and just hope that I see a zero, right? In that case, the state, the first register will collapse to cat x, which is what I'm trying to prepare. Um, or I can do something more clever called amplitude uh, amplification to boost the part of the state that ends in cat zero and that way prepare cat x. Now, this is kind of a sketch. Uh, there's a lot of details swept under the rug here, but this is essentially how the HHL algorithm works at least the most basic HHL algorithm. It has actually been improved in a number of ways. Uh, and the point is that under these assumptions I listed before, like the, the matrix is well-conditioned, you can prepare cat B. Um, 
and you can implement the matrix E to the IA, that unitary efficiently, um, you can efficiently prepare an amplitude encoded version of X in time much, much smaller than a dimension of, the, of your linear system, right? So just remember, this is a capital N by capital N linear system. Classically, it takes you time more than capital N to solve it. The quantum case, under the right assumptions, prepares the, the state version of the solution vector X in only polylogarithmic time. Okay, so these are the three main algorithms I wanted to explain with a sketch of how they work. Let me just list a few other things that a quantum computer can do. So possibly the most important thing that a quantum computer can do, and this was also the motivation for Richard Feynman to dream up this idea in the first place, is to do simulation of quantum systems. And there's actually a talk later this morning that's gonna talk about simulation of quantum systems. And this could be extremely important for, let's say, uh, designing large molecules that are good drugs, uh, designing good materials. People sometimes even mention understanding high temperature superconductivity. If you're able to efficiently simulate other quantum systems, you can do a lot of nice work. Um, there's another class of quantum algorithms called random walk algorithms. They sort of do a quantum random walk on a graph, and they can more efficiently solve search problems that way. You can do faster optimization, so uh, you can use, for instance, Grover's algorithm and things that are derived from it to maximize some unstructured function, but you can also improve backtracking algorithms. You can solve things like linear programs faster on a quantum computer. Um, and last but not least, quantum speedups for machine learning. So this was Miles' talk before. I think this is a very interesting uh, area. I'm also trying to get into it. Um, I don't think there's a killer app there yet because there's large issues having to do with how you can access your classical data. So the stronger assumptions you make there on how you can access your classical data, the, the nicer things you can do. Um, and I think this is an area which we'll see a lot of development in, in subsequent years. Uh, and let me also spend one slide on, on, on emphasizing what quantum computers cannot do, right? So I'm a computer scientist. We care not only about efficient quantum algorithms. We also care about proving that there are no efficient algorithms for certain problems. We're not very good at that. Um, so first thing to notice here is that, uh, so you can prove that if you have a quantum computer, let's say it acts on n qubits and it uses a polynomial in n number of gates, uh, you can actually simulate that classically with a polynomial amount of space. The classical simulation will be exponentially slower, but you can do the simulation. Uh, and that means that if you don't care about efficiency, then the class of problems you can compute on a quantum computer is no different from the class of problems you can compute on a classical computer. So in computer science, there's this thing called the Church-Turing thesis, which essentially says that everything that, that you can compute on some reasonable machine, you can also compute on a, on a classical computer. Um, and that remains true, even if by reasonable machine we mean quantum computer. Uh, for many problems, we can actually prove that quantum computers give no significant speed up, or at most a quadratic speed up. For instance, you can prove that this Grover search algorithm that I mentioned is essentially optimal. You cannot do search faster than square root of n on a quantum computer. Um, and this, is, this, this relates to the last point I wanted to make. Uh, so very often, especially when people understand this idea of quantum parallelism, but they don't yet understand the idea of, of interference, then they say, oh, great, I can solve very large uh, problems. For instance, the so-called traveling salesman problem. Uh, traveling salesman problem is to, to find a route in a graph that goes through every vertex exactly once. And people say, yeah, well, you know, I'm just going to try out all the exponentially many routes in this graph. I'm just gonna try that out in superposition and then somehow magically I will find the best route, right? And this doesn't work just because quantum parallelism by itself is useless. Um, so there's all these famous uh, so-called NP-complete problems such as uh, the traveling salesman problem but also solving satisfiability, uh, more physics type problems like optimizing spin glasses or protein folding. And for all of these, we strongly believe that quantum computers cannot solve them efficiently. There's good evidence for that. We don't have a proof, but there's good evidence for that. And next time, like there was an article in the Washington Post last year that sort of hyped quantum computing. And in its first paragraph, it claimed that the traveling salesman problem would be efficiently solvable on a quantum computer. Don't believe that kind of stuff. All right, so this is an, an unproven conjecture, but there's reasonable evidence for this. Which brings me to my conclusion slide. I think I'm sort of on time. Uh, so quantum mechanics, as of course you know, as you probably know this better than I do, this is the best physical theory we have today. Uh, and it's fundamentally different from classical physics. It, it involves funny things like superposition, interference with positive and negative amplitudes adding up, entanglement. 
And the field of quantum algorithms is a field that tries to use these, these quantum effects to speed up computation. Right, and I mentioned a number of examples. There's Shor's efficient algorithm for factoring. There's Grover's algorithm for search. There's the HHL algorithm for solving linear equations. Uh, and there's a whole bunch of others. Um, and I think there's much more left to be discovered here. I always end my talks with this picture here. My name is the wolf. This is a very confused wolf. And it means I, I need to think more about uh, finding more quantum algorithms. So I thank you for your attention.